Praise God. Good morning. Well, good afternoon to all of you. Um, deciding to go live today. Uh, it's 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Today we're going to talk about how to actually see the kingdom of God. How to actually see the kingdom of God. Um, and if you can, uh, let me see if uh, this is able to work through here. If you can, please do me a favor and like the stream. It really does go a long way and it helps us engage with uh, whatever stream that you're on. If Whether you're on Facebook or whether you're on YouTube, I want to talk to you today about how to actually see the kingdom of God. Amen. So just give me just uh, one moment here. see here we're good public all right next all right praise god amen all right i'm having some difficulty with instagram but it's okay i'm just gonna keep it at that all right blessings to all of you i want to talk to you again how to see how to actually see the kingdom of god in your life how to actually see the kingdom of God in your life. And um, it's going to begin in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Just something I was thinking about. And uh, I pray that it blesses you. Amen. Don't forget to like the stream. If you're watching uh, from YouTube, uh, I see that some are watching from Facebook. Blessings. Now let's turn. Let's get right into it. How to actually see the kingdom of God. What do I mean by this? How to actually see? Well, we're going to look at what Jesus tells us concerning uh, this reality. And it's found in John chapter 3. And I'm going to show you um, just exactly um, what Jesus is referring to. And um, see here. All these things are not working here. <laughs> Let me see something. Um, there it is. Perfect. John chapter 3. And I want to read this to you. We're going to read a few verses, but it goes something like this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was a spiritual authority in the house of Israel. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, and no one can do these signs unless you do, that you do, excuse me, unless God is with him. So what do we see here? We see a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Not all Pharisees were bad. <laughs> you know, some were very self-righteous. Others were open to the gospel. And this specific Pharisee, um, recognized the authority that Jesus carried. And he calls him rabbi, which is teacher. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God. For we know that no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. How did Nicodemus recognize and see Jesus? By the signs and the wonders that Jesus performed. Signs and wonders point to the sign giver, the Lord Jesus. In verse 3, we see that Jesus answers and he says to him, Most assuredly, I say to you. Most assuredly is a Aramaic colloquial uh, term. A colloquial term is something that um, is a cultural expression. So, for example, if I were to say to you, I tell you the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. That is a colloquial expression. That is an American expression of saying, hey, listen to what I'm saying, because what I'm saying is actually the truth. So, um, does that make sense? Okay. All right, all right. Praise God. Um, all right. So 
most assuredly, another translation of most assuredly is truly, truly I tell you, or I tell you the truth. This is Jesus' way of saying, what I'm about to say to you is extremely important. Pay attention to what I'm going to say because what I'm going to say to you is exceptionally important. That's a colloquial term. So most assuredly or truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see, see, see the kingdom of God. I love this here. This word uh, see is the Greek word iden. And according to the pocket lexicon of the Greek New Testament, it means to see. It means to, uh, it means saw. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. This word born again is the Greek word anathen, and it can mean from above or anew. So another way of saying this is that truly, truly, I say to you, you cannot see, you cannot perceive the kingdom of heaven unless you are born anew or born from above. You see, the kingdom of heaven cannot be seen by natural terms. The kingdom of heaven cannot be seen with the natural mindset, with the perceiving of the physical eyes. The kingdom of heaven must be perceived by spiritual perception, by spiritual sight. This is why Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless anyone is, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what on earth does that even mean? Well, if we turn to John chapter one, it says to those who have been, um, who have received the blessed son of God, the Lord Jesus, to them, he gave the right to become children of of God, children not born of the flesh, nor by the will of parents, nor of blood, but of God. You may have been born accidentally. You may have been born prematurely according to natural terms. Maybe the way that you were conceived was not the greatest way in your own mind, or maybe it was an accidental thing, but in God, there are no accidents. And you could be born one way and you can be born by specific circumstances, but, but there is a second birth. There is a birth from above. When you receive Jesus as your savior, when you confess him as Lord, you are receiving the life of God. And let's turn to John chapter one to see what Jesus really means concerning what he was speaking to um, our, our, uh, this leader, um, Nicodemus. I love this. I love this. This is John chapter 1, and this is verse 9. And it says as follows, That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. The light is Jesus. He, see this light, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. This, this is light. Light is not an it. Light is himself, the Lord Jesus. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But look at what verse 12 says. Again, this is in relationship, in tandem with John chapter 3. But as many as received him. What does this word receive mean? It's the Greek word elaban. It, it means lambano. I love this word lambano because what it means is it's to take. According to the concise dictionary of words in the Greek New Testament, this word lambano means to be used um, by very uh, various applications. It means to violently seize, to accept, 
to bring, to call, to come on, to come into, to lay hold of, to obtain, to take up, to receive is this word lambano. It is to seize. See, Christ came into the world. The world did not know him. The world did not recognize him. But to whoever who has seized him, who have received him, this word lambano, to take up for yourself, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. How do we take up the Son of God? How do we receive? How do we seize him by believing? To believe in his name. The, the, the power is in his blessed name. Who were born not of blood, nor by the will of flesh or human beings, nor the will of man, but of God. See, this is the way to truly see the kingdom of God in operation. You want to actually see the kingdom of heaven? You must receive Christ. Why? Because Christ is the light. Christ is the life. True life comes from him. You see, I love this. Uh, in John 1, we see verses 1 through 5 concerning Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What do we see here? That in the beginning, before the beginning of time, was the Word. What is this word, word? It's the Greek word logos or logos, depending how you pronounce it. But this word logos is a beautiful Greek term. And this word logos is where we get the word logic from. It's where we get the word expression. It's actually where we get the English word language. This is why it's pronounced word. The Son of God is the language of the Father. The appearing of Christ is the visible interpretation and language of the unseen Father. No one has ever seen God at any time. Christ is the visible, physical, logic, language, and interpretation of what the Father is like. You see, this word, this living expression, was in the beginning. And the word, this language, this logic, this expression, was with God, and the word was God. See, God is one, yet three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, the unseen, mind, the unseen, uncreated, Father. And then you have the Son, the visible image of the invisible God. Kind of like looking at, a, at the sun, a physical sun. What do you see? You can't see the ball of light itself. You can see, you can see the, the, you can't see the physical visible sun, but you can see the radiance of that light. Jesus Christ is the radiance of the invisible God. He is the blessed life and light of who the Father is. And just as you feel the, the rays of the sun and the warmth of the sun, the Holy Spirit is the part of God that is on the earth that you can perceive and know and experience for yourself. I love it because if you look at the, the, um, the Genesis narrative, you look at Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. There was evening, and there was morning, and it was the first day. What do we see there? In the Hebrew Bible, we see something very interesting. It says, In the beginning... God, and then there's these Hebrew letters right next to it, Aleph and Tav. It's pronounced, I believe, Et. In the beginning, God, and then this Hebrew word Et, which is Aleph and Tav, which is translated as A and Z, the beginning and the end. 
created the heavens and the earth. So we see that the word, this Aleph and Tav, is the first letter of the language of Hebrew, and it's the last letter of the language of Hebrew combined. When Jesus appears to John in the island of Patmos, what does Jesus say? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. Jesus speaking Hebrew, and so John speaking Hebrew as well. Another way of Jesus saying it to him is, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am the beginning and the end. I was there in the beginning, and I am there at the end. See, Jesus is not just some philosophical person. Jesus is not some person that just makes you, uh, is a good teacher of good morals. No, Jesus is God. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible kingdom of heaven on earth. You see, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says, all things, all things were made through him, through this word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Going back to Genesis, what do we see? God said, let there be light. And this word said was God. This, this, this utterance that came from the invisible father was also God. This utterance, this word, the very word of God created all things and framed all things with the power of his word. And the power of his word is his blessed son. All things were made through him, this word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him, this word, this son, is what? Life. Life. And the life was the light of men. You see, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it or overtake it or overpower it. Do you see? In Christ, there is life. John chapter 10, uh, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you may have life, in life more abundantly. His, his apostle John in 1 John says, He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not the life. See, because in Christ is life, true life. It's the word Zoe. It is the life of God. It is the divine life. And it radiates and emanates from the Son of God. And when you've received the Son of God, that life that is in Him is now in you. And when you've received Him, you become a child of God. See, the Son of God became man so that men can be sons of God. It is a beautiful transfiguration, a reality of the kingdom. So going back to John chapter 3, with this premise in mind, what do we see? We see Jesus, the Word made flesh. We see. Here's Nicodemus, and he's like, how can, you know, he, he says in verse, uh, in verse two, we know that you're from God. No one can do these things unless God is with them. We know that you're of God because all these signs and wonders that you do. And Jesus does not take the flattery. Jesus doesn't even say amen. Jesus doesn't even say, praise God. Amen. I give the glory to God. No, Jesus hits the religious Pharisee between the eyes and says these words. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, in John's gospel, the second chapter, it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to any man for he knew what was in man. And so he hits the religious spirit between the face. And the religious spirit will also try to accommodate and try to um, speak words of flattery. But the kingdom of heaven and the life of God and all of Jesus and who he is, see, the kingdom is 
much more superior than the old wineskin of religious order. The religious order would say, do these things in order to be found of God, but the kingdom of God is God becomes man and prepares a table for him and communes with him and brings him to the divine nature. Here is something that is a mystery that we'll never comprehend on this side of the earth. That by these precious promises, through these things, we may become partakers of God's divine nature. We are sons of God. We partake in God's divine nature. The nature of God we get to partake of because we've received the Son of God. And as we've received the Son of God, what we've received is life and light, the light. And so we see that now Nicodemus responds with this. How can a man be born when he is old? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? See, here's something so fascinating about the kingdom of heaven and how to see the kingdom of heaven. Listen, Jesus, the God-man, spoke in two dimensions in one place. Things that he said were heard with visible physical ears, but they were not comprehended by natural terms. Many times Jesus would say something and people would miss it. One of the greatest miracles that Jesus performed, the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus over and over says, Lazarus sleeps. And they did not understand what he meant by this. He speaks in one way, but he's heard another way. He speaks as a man from heaven, yet men of the earth don't perceive or see because they don't see him. They don't see him as he truly is. And the only way to hear him and to see him truly is by receiving him by being born from above and being born again. And so here is Jesus speaking, being born from above. He is speaking from a superior place of heaven. And Nicodemus, a man with all these credentials, with all of these accolades, with all of these applauses of man, can't even comprehend the dynamics of the kingdom. Jesus speaks in one way. Jesus told Martha, I, he's like, he says, your brother's going to be raised up. And, and, and he, here is God in the flesh. And Martha misinterprets and says, yes, I know he'll be raised at the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Many things that Jesus did, he would say and do. Speaking of things from above, but those of the natural order could not comprehend or discern what he was doing. You can only see the kingdom of God by spiritual terms. This is why people insult Christianity. People insult the things that they don't understand because they perceive things through the vein and the lenses of the five physical senses, failing to recognize that there, are, there is a spiritual reality that is so much more comprehensive and so much more fulfilling there is a connection with the Spirit of God that is so superior, so mighty, so wonderful that it baffles and offends the intellect of the flesh. And so here is Jesus and Nicodemus is asking, how can a man be born when he is born again, when he is old? Can he enter it a second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he speaking of? He's talking about receiving Christ. Receiving, being born again of the Spirit and, and, and coming into him through the water of baptism. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What is Jesus saying to us? 
See, the word spirit is the Greek word pneuma. It's where we get the word um, pneumonia. Because the, the word spirit means breath or wind. Here is a double play on words. He, you could say the wind blows where it wishes, or you could say the spirit blows or breathes where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit or of the wind. The spirit has a mind of his own. The spirit is very much like the wind. You cannot see the wind. You cannot visibly see the wind. You cannot tell where it's going, but you can definitely feel the effects of it. You can hear the sound. You cannot tell where it comes from, but you can see the effects. In the same way, Jesus tells us, the Spirit is very much the same way. You cannot see the wind unless you are born again. You cannot even perceive the wind unless you are born of the wind, born of the Spirit. And Jesus is saying these things and then Nicodemus is scratching his head because he's a natural man with a religious vestment on. And so that's how re the religious order is. It's like a dead body with makeup on, trying to be alive. And so we see this truth. We see that Jesus speaks life. He does not understand Nicodemus. And we say, and he says, how can these things be? See, he does not perceive because he has not the spirit. Verse 10 says this, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify of what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. Why is he speaking in a plurality? He is speaking from the place of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son testifies of the Father. The Father testifies of the Son. The Spirit testifies of the Blessed Son. We speak what we know. We testify what we have seen. And you didn't, do not receive our witness. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You see, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Side note, over and over again, we see that Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. What is Jesus? Why is he calling himself this? You see, the son of man is a term of the Son of God, it is a prophetic foreshadow of the Messiah. And we see this in the book of Daniel. Let me, let me show you exactly uh, where it is. Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to turn there. This is why Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And once you understand why Jesus refers to himself as son of man, you begin to see the scriptures in a so in such a beautiful light. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 onward, Psalms, Proverbs, let me see if I can there it is. See if my software can work. Just give me a second here. Daniel. Seven. Come on. <laughs> sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Come on. Let's go. Okay. It is not working. So I'm just going to read it to you. Daniel chapter seven. I love this. I saw in the night visions 
And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, the son of man, oh man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him or worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. This is why Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, because he is the apocalyptic foreshadow of the Messiah that's described in Daniel 7. You see? So it's a beautiful um, reality that we see here. So powerful. So he says, no one, I'm just going to take my Bible now because we're having a little bit of tech difficulties. He says, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended, the son of man. You see? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. See, it's interesting that Jesus refers Himself as seeing the kingdom of God by two ways, being born again, and also seeing the Son of Man. And He, and he refers to Himself in verse 14 as this parallel, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up or raised so that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. What is he speaking of here? He's speaking of Numbers chapter 21, verse 9. In Numbers chapter 21, the people of Israel began to complain against Moses, the servant of the Lord. And the Bible says that God sent these fiery serpents, these blazing serpents, and they began to bite the children of Israel because of their murmuring and their complaining. And these burning venomous serpents were killing off many of the Israelites. And the Israelites began to complain and murmur and cry out, O oh Lord, have mercy. Moses cries out to the Lord and Moses says this. He says, Lord, what do I do? I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and God says, take and I want you to create a brazen serpent, a brazen bronze, brazen. Brazen is two alloys, two metals combined into one. And I want you to put it on a pole. If you have ever seen medical terminology, um, some of the symbolism of, med of a medical term is you see a pole with two serpents. That comes from Numbers chapter 21. And it's very interesting because we see that Moses takes this brazen serpent. He takes two metals to create an alloy. Bronze, or I think brass and silver. I, I don't... What, whatever alloy it is, it's two metals, brazen, copper and, and, and brass or copper. And so some two metals make, bra make bronze or brazen. And it's interesting because that speaks of two natures within Christ. Two metals in one. And he is, we see that he's put on a pole, this brazen serpent. And is it an interesting that those who are outside of Christianity don't understand the concept of God becoming man. They see it as idolatrous. Look at the parallels here. In the, in, in, the, in, the, in the book of Numbers and in Deuteronomy, Moses gives us the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other engraven images. You shall have no graven images. You shall have nothing made to look like anything. Yet Moses or obeys God to create an image of a serpent, and yet that image is the very thing that brings healing to Israel. 
and see the gospel is offensive because it looks idolatrous and yet it is not. It is the wisdom of the ages revealed. So we see two alloys, two natures as a serpent. Copper and tin, thank you. Put into one alloy on a pole and raised up. And whoever looked on the serpent, the scriptures say, that whoever looked, who was bitten by these serpents, they were healed. Now, what on earth does this mean? We've all been bitten by the effects of sin. And God, in his wisdom, took on humanity. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He became the serpent on the pole so that anyone who looks upon him would be healed. To believe in Christ is to rightly see him. This God-man, this man who became sin for us, being put on a pole, being raised up on the cross. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. What is he speaking of? The, that Christ was put on a pole. The brazen one was put as a sacrifice for sin and was placed on the cross and was raised and elevated, suspended above the earth that whoever looks upon him would be saved. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim as you look at his glorious face. They that look to him are radiant, as the scriptures say. And he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. A serpent is a representation of sin, but also it is a representation of wisdom. This is why Jesus tells us, he told the disciples, be harmless as doves, yet wise as serpents. In the ancient biblical world, serpents were seen as wise. The wisdom of God is the foolishness of the cross. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Look, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There's a double word play here. What do we see? There's a raising up. The cross, the Son of Man being placed on the cross, being lifted, but also the Son of Man being raised to life. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must rightly see the Son of God. As you rightly see Him as Lord and Savior and King of Kings, you receive Him by believing. And as you believe, you rightly see Him. And as you rightly see Him, you are transformed You look to the brazen one. For God, I love this, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Eternal life begins the moment you say, I do, to the bridegroom. Eternal life is to know the Lord and believe in the one whom he sent. This is eternal life. Eternal life is not just when you die, go into the sweet by and by. No, eternal life begins the moment you know God. I didn't say that. Jesus says that in John 17, verse 3. He says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you and believe in the one you have sent. Why? Because when you know the Lord and believe in the one whom he has sent, you receive the very life of God. You partake of his divine nature. It's what the ancients called theosis. It is to become a partaker of the divine life of God. God becoming, the Son of God becoming man so that men would become sons of God. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, speaking of the Son of God. And men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. See, friend, if you love your sin, it means that you love the darkness. How can we repent by looking upon the light of the Son of God? Looking at His kindness. The Bible says that it's the goodness of the Lord, the kindness of God that leads a man to repentance. See, your soul is too expensive. It's so costly that God sent His only begotten Son. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been brought wrought in God. How can we see the kingdom of heaven? How can we see him? How can we rightly perceive him? We must look and believe. How can we see the kingdom of heaven by receiving his son? I find it no coincidence, my favorite verse of all time, for those who have been following the ministry for quite some time know my favorite verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 12. Through 18, and look at what it says. Therefore, having such hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel will not look intently at the end of what was fading away. See, there was a glory that was destined to fade away, prophetically speaking, until the time of redemption, until the appearing of Christ. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, the veil of religiosity, because it is removed in Messiah, in Christ. Now look at what it says in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 3. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. This is about seeing. Look, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, there is a, re a veil of religiosity. There is a veil of Satan. There are two veils discussed in uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 4. The first veil is the, the religious one. The holding on to the old wineskin, the law, the holding on to the legal, the legal system without the spirit. The second one is the satanic veil that Satan puts on the minds of those who don't believe. We see that in 1, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 where it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world, which is Satan, has blinded the minds, minds of un, the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel in the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. There are two veils. Which veil do you need to let go of? Maybe today there's a veil of religiosity. You need to let go of it. A veil of works, thinking that your works is good enough to get you into the born again experience. Maybe you're watching today and there's a veil that Satan has put over your mind because you do not believe. If you turn to the Lord and you cry out to him and humble yourself, 
the veil will be removed by Christ himself. And I love this. Verse 16 says, whenever, of 2 Corinthians 3.16, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, without veils, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Now, let's just stop here for just a moment. Whenever we turn to the Lord, there is a veil that is taken away. But look at what he says. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Guess what mirrors were made of back in the day? They were brazen. Again, the alloy of tin and copper. They were polished in such a way. They were reddish in complexion. And you had to intently look quite carefully and intently to see your own image. Mirrors did not look like mirrors the way they look like today. We think of mirror, the 21st century mirror. It, 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 it was not like this. It was either made by a, by a brazen polished uh, piece of metal that you looked intently that was reddish in appearance. And isn't that the gospel? The brazen one, the one covered in that reddish complexion, the blood of Christ, looking intently to the Lord, looking intently to that blessed Son of God, the reddish one, the one that is red, covered by the blood, the one that is covered with blood, looking more intently and more closely to him and being changed into that which you behold, beholding it as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. What is the glory of the Lord? The glory of the Lord is Christ. He is the King of glory. In Psalm chapter 24, he is the Prince of glory described in the Pauline epistles. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed. How are we transformed? By rightly looking to the Lord. See, it's not in self-help. It's not in self-help gurus. It's not in inspirational motivation. There's nothing wrong with motivational uh, messaging. But it is not the gospel. True transfiguration, true transformation is by looking to the glory of the Lord through the revealed gospel, the word of God. It takes, as you look through the looking glass of the word of God, you begin to see the word made flesh. Beholding it as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. What image? The glory of Christ. From glory to glory, just as from the spirit of the Lord, true transfiguration, true transformation comes by looking at the transfigured one. You want to see heaven? You want to actually perceive the workings of God? You want to perceive the kingdom of heaven in your midst? Look to Christ. Receive Christ. If there's anyone on this dream that I'm, I'm speaking to, maybe you don't know Christ. Friend, today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart. You might say to yourself, what do I do? There's someone watching, a Middle Eastern man right now, a young man. You're in your late, uh, late teens, early 20s. You just asked yourself in your head, in your heart, what do I do to be born again? Friend, it's simple. Look to him and invite him in. Ask him to forgive you of all your sins. Ask him to reveal himself to you. And confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him up. You will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto salvation. And with confession, when he confesses this reality, it is sealed. You might say to yourself, why physically confess it? Because Christ physically was made visible. How do we perceive him? How do we see the kingdom of heaven? How do we rightly hear and how do we rightly see? By seeing him. By receiving him. Amen? Amen. If you do not know the Lord Jesus, just say this, Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart, 
I'm a sinner. Cleanse me. I humble myself. I receive you. I want to be your son. I believe in my heart that you died for me. You came for me. Wash me, cleanse me. I believe God raised you from the dead. I confess you as Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God came as the Son of... The, the Son of God came into the world of man so that man can come into God's world to become sons of God. Great is this mystery of the gospel. God being made visible, vindicated of angels, taken up into glory, taking us who believe in him into glory, becoming the captain of our salvation. You want to see heaven? You want to see the kingdom of heaven? Receive the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Well, friends, um, if you're watching on Facebook, I encourage you to join our YouTube channel every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. We spend time in the presence of God and we read the scriptures together as a way of, of, um, of just fellowshipping. For those that are asking what my Facebook is, I'm just using my personal Facebook profile. I've gotten thousands of friend requests. I can't accept them all. I apologize. My Facebook is maxed. But if you have not subscribed to the channel, I encourage you to please do so. You won't be disappointed because we center everything on the presence of the Lord. We exalt him. So, if you know someone that doesn't know the Lord Jesus, send this stream to them. Share it with them. Tell them, hey, you need to listen to this. I want to tell you, your soul is too expensive. So much so that Christ paid for it. You were bought with a price. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. So uh, some quick little announcements. I just want to say this real quick to you, okay? Um, we will not be streaming tomorrow or Monday. Only because I'm picking up my dear friend Wally Gilmore. And I won't have time to come in in the morning time. Amen? Someone's asking, where can I get your shirt? Um, this shirt was created by my brother Andy. So it's... It's not for sale. <laughs> also, if you're in Texas, in the Houston area, I encourage you guys, come on out. We already have 537 people registered for Houston. Sign up, register, it's free. If you want to partner with the ministry, you can text GLORY to the number 801801, or you could visit our website at fathersglory.org. If you're in the Fort Smith, Arkansas area, come and join our church, House of Glory. Omir, where are you from? You have a very interesting name. You just stood out to me. Join, join us. 1.30 p.m., we have a time of intercession and travail. And at 2 p.m., we have service until the good Lord releases us. We are unapologetic, unapologetically spirit-filled. We are unapologetically revival-centered. We are unapologetically fivefold. So join us. If you haven't subscribed to House of Glory YouTube channel, you can look for the at sign, at sign, the House of Glory. Amen? Yeah, we don't have time. Um... Unfortunately, for Friday stream and Monday stream, okay? Because I'm, I'm going to be taking care of a few important uh, details. But, um, but yes, nice to meet you, Omar. 
blessings. All right, my friends, it's time for me to get going. Unfortunately, I don't have any more time because I have to prepare for this evening. We have service tonight. We are, we are continuing our Bible study on the book of Ephesians. And um, it's unfortunately, it's not live stream. We only live stream on Sundays. Okay? So, if you're sick and your body, come on out. If you're oppressed and tormented, come on out. If you need salvation, come on out. We will pray for you. We will lay hands on you suddenly. <laughs> God bless you. Also, follow us on Instagram at... Father's glory, I-N-T-L. Amen. God bless you. And we will see you on Wednesday of next week. Blessings to you. I might stream from my phone maybe tomorrow, but I'm not sure. So I don't want to throw it out there just yet. All right. Blessings to you all. Love you all. Jesus is Lord. And I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. Like the stream. Share it with a friend. And we will see you until next time. Blessings.